All right, so we're going back to Barcelona, and this is the apartment building that, that Gaudí um, had designed. It's really cool. It's now, people are still living in there, but you can do tours of his old apartment on, on top and all, but absolutely wild. It's on one of the main streets of Barcelona, and just the design is, is 60s drug trip, even though he built it in like 1880. And this is the top, and here's where it gets really wild. He's got this undulating top on here with kind of African modern art on there. So very, very wild. And so you go through, there's, there's flower pots on here, and there's this undulating design, and they walk through. Of course, they put fences around it so that people wouldn't, wouldn't fall off, but that wasn't part of the original design. This is what it looks like. So you've got this kind of African-looking modernist art sticking up, and I'm not quite sure the symbolism of why there's four of these guys here and one of them here, but each one is different. Each one of the masks has a different appearance to it. And this is all you come out from the top apartments. And if you look right here, the coverings over the windows on the top almost look like a battleship. And so this was the very top here. And you can walk through here and they've got a little bit about uh, his history that was there. But just interesting, each one of these masks is unique. and. It almost looks like Imperial Troopers, you know, from, from Star Wars. So we have to keep slipping Star Wars in here today. That's going to be our theme. And then one other look. And again, you can see there's just some of them here. And then there's these abstract designs on the corner. Nothing is even. It all undulates through. And as I said, this looks like the side of a battleship, you know, and they've opened up the gun ports. But this is really the attic of, of the apartment building. And then this is the entranceway going up with these um, wrought iron, um, you know, things on the balcony. Sort of this very, very wild architecture. Okay, so today we're going to talk about glaucoma. We can't talk about glaucoma without understanding what the anatomy of the trabecular meshwork is. And so there's a couple different ways we can describe the trabecular meshwork. The first is if you're looking at the meshwork in a gonial mirror. And so, Adam, let's start with that. So we're going to look, say we're looking at this trabecular meshwork in a gonial mirror. What's the most anterior part that you see? Schwabi's line. All right, and what is Schwabi's line, which would be right there? That's the termination of the decimase membrane. Okay, so where decimase membrane on the inner surface of the cornea terminates, it often leaves a little bulb, and that's Schwabi's line. And when you look through with your gonial mirror, you'll see a little white line. Now, I really encourage you guys when you're seeing new glaucoma patients to gonio them because, you know, on the, on the pictures here, those lines are this wide, you know, when you look at it in the book. But when you look in there, you look with the mirror and the patient's squeezing and there's a bubble under your, you know, under your, your thing that you're holding there. And, have, and you see, oh, there's a couple lines of guys oh, that open, is it closed? You know, the only way you're going to be able to tell what an angle looks like is you got to do hundreds of them. So, you know, when glaucoma people come in, start doing them often. All right, so we start with... Schwabi's line. We come down from that, Adam. What's the next layer you see? Okay, and, and how do we divide the trabecular meshwork? Uh, pigmented and non-pigmented. And which is which? Which is more anterior? Non-pigmented. All right, so the non-pigmented is this more anterior area you see, and then the area you see down here is more the pigmented area. And then as you come, you see a little kind of a white line right here at the posterior surface. And what is that? Okay, the scleral spur, and then lastly, you can see part of the ciliary body or even iris. And so, when you look at the scleral spur, what the scleral spur is, if you think about it, the trabecular meshwork is shaped like a triangle. And it sits, you know, with this little spur, this little lip of sclera sticks out. So if you make your thumb and fingers like this, the meshwork fits in there like a triangle, the apex here and base here. And the scleral spur goes all the way around, 360 degrees, and will help to kind of support that and, and keep that trabecular meshwork there. Now, um, Russ, there's another um, you know, way we describe the trabecular meshwork, and we kind of divide it into zones, if you will, and, and what, what kind of descriptions do we use there? Um, not sure. I feel like, like juxta canalicular. All right, that's the inside most part. Okay, and what's the third? Uvial 
UVL, exactly. So if you kind of divide it this way, you know, there's, there's corneal sclera, there's uveal, and then the most important layer, at least to me, is juxtacanalicular. And what does juxtacanalicular mean? So that's the portion that's right next to Schlem's canal. So that's this area right here, right next to Schlem's canal. Now here's Schlem's canal right here. What is Schlem's canal? So, I mean, it's uh, 360 degree channel that's going to be the area of the drainage. Exactly. So you think about it. Think of it as a flattened, like a, a bicycle tire inner tube. It's not a round structure, it's kind of a flat oval structure, but again, it goes 360 all the way around in that Schlem's canal. When you look at close up, the reason why the juxtacanalicular trabecular measurement is important is this is where a lot of the resistance to outflow from the eye occurs. And so people think this is where the money is in open angle glaucoma. So when you look at the mesh work, it's got bars of these little collagen with some elastin fibers around them and these bars have endothelial cells around them also. And then so aqueous fluid will passively diffuse through here, but when you get to the juxtacanalicular area, it's not just open, it doesn't just passively diffuse, there is some active transport that goes on there. Now this is not tight junctions like a blood vessel, but there is some junction, junctionality here and some resistance to flow. So when we, when we think of the aqueous, you know, you want to track, let's, let's call it, track a, a milliliter of aqueous. Um, Ashley, so we're going to track the aqueous. Where is it produced? Um, in the ciliary body, okay, and then where does it proceed from there? So here it comes, it comes through the trabecular meshwork, just the canalicular tissue, Schlem's canal. Where does the aqueous go when it leaves Schlem's canal? Um, the, I'm not sure. It's an easy one to remember because they're called aqueous veins. And so it actually percolates from Schlem's canal into this little venous system that goes around them. It's called aqueous veins and sometimes people call these collector channels and the reason that this is important is we've got some new little micro incisional devices now that are going into the trabecular measurement to treat glaucoma. People are saying how many of these should you put in? We're just figuring out where they work best and it turns out where these aqueous veins gather, they call these collector channels, it turns out that if you put one of these devices into Schlem's canal near one of these channels then it works better. And so the, the person who's really responsible for, um, you know, showing us that these exist is actually um, Rob Stegman from South Africa. If you ever want to look up the most awesome videos I've ever seen in ophthalmology, look up Rob Stegman. And he's got these videos where he will unroof Schlem's canal and then he'll put dye into them or he'll squirt something clear into them. And you will actually see on the surface of the episclera the aqueous veins and you'll see them blanching out and then going back down, he'll put some dye in there and it'll show where these collector channels are. Beautiful, beautiful videos. So if you get a chance, take a look at those. And here's a close up. Here's that juxtacanalicular tissue. Here's Schlem's canal and it's kind of this collapsed inner tube look to it. It does have some endothelial cells around them. And the reason that that's important is now we're starting to look into surgery where we don't try to treat glaucoma by opening up the whole trabecular meshwork and then letting aqueous flow from the anterior chamber under the conge, we're now doing some procedures where you actually unroof Schlem's canal and then put a little suture in it or blow it up with viscoelastic or something so that you have a more controlled way of getting the aqueous to come out. Now this is showing you one of those aqueous veins and collectors. So here is the meshwork, here's Schlem's canal, here's this aqueous vein and then it goes out onto the episcleral surface underneath the conge and they'll be right here and so I tell you guys this every year when you're in the VA and you're looking at these people with the slit lamp look just beyond just behind the limbus and see if you can find aqueous veins and if you if you really look hard for them you can see them in most people and what you'll see is you'll see some veins but you'll see some box carring of the RBCs in there and that'll be because there's little clear aqueous flowing through in there too. So you have to look deep 
in the episclera through the conjunctiva with your slit lamp, but try it and, and see if you can't see those. Okay, so the most common type of glaucoma is open angle glaucoma. And Brian, can we tell that a patient has open angle glaucoma by doing a light microscopy of the meshwork? No. And why is that? Well, we don't know what causes it, but the interesting thing is on light microscopy, there's no difference between a glaucomatous angle and an angle of, of someone who doesn't have open angle glaucoma of the same age. So when you look at trabecular mesh works, um, in younger people, they're a little more cellular, they've got more endothelial cells, they're not quite as compacted as we get older, the trabecular bars compact, there's less cells around them, but to be honest, you take a 70-year-old with open angle glaucoma, 70-year-old without open angle glaucoma, they all look the same on light microscopy. Now, on EM, you can pick up some differences, so it's hard to diagnose open angle glaucoma on light microscopy. So when we think of glaucoma, we think of it, we divide it into a few different areas, and, and the simplest way I like to think of it is, you know, you've either got open angle glaucoma, you've got angle recession glaucoma, or you've got narrow angle glaucoma. So when we're looking at open angle glaucoma, glaucoma where the angles are open. You can have primary open angle glaucoma or you can have secondary open angle glaucomas. And so Nico, this is a secondary open angle glaucoma. And why would I be showing you this picture if we're talking about glaucoma? Can you see the angle from this picture? No. What do you see in this picture, though, that's interesting? I see, I guess, that the translumination defects on the iris all around it. Exactly. And what's the pattern of the translumination defects? and it's radial. And so when you look, you see that this patient has these radial transillumination defects. So you shine the light straight through the pupil, that light bounces off the retina, comes back, and you see these orangish transillumination defects here. What is that indicative of? Pigment dispersion, exactly. And why is it in this pattern? Well, people argued about this for years, why pigment dispersion glaucoma occurs. And it was interesting, there was a guy at Dartmouth who finally just took some you know, donated eyes with pigment dispersion glaucoma and looked at the path and said, okay, what is it that causes this? And what they did is when you flip this over and you're now looking at the posterior aspect, this is the posterior iris surface, these are the, where the zonules insert. It turns out the zonular bundles that hold the lens in place are running along here, and for some reason you get posterior bowing of the iris in these pigment dispersion cases, and it scrapes against those zonular bundles. So this, you can see, lines up. If you can imagine, the lens would be sitting here, and these bundles of zonules run this way and then insert here in the ciliary body, and as those scrape on the iris, you get dispersion of pigment. So this is a secondary open angle glaucoma pigment dispersion syndrome. In pigment dispersion glaucoma, here we see, here's an iris, cornea, trabecular meshwork. Look at all the pigment in the meshwork. Now, where else beside the meshwork does the pigment in pigment dispersion syndrome settle? And we're still at Nico, chance to save yourself. He's looking quickly in his book. Oh, God, where was that? On what? Surprisingly, not really. Where else do you see in a slit lamp do they settle? The cornea. The cornea. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's right. Just you have. To, it's it's all in perspective. Just remember, we tell all our cardiology colleagues the purpose of the heart is to pump blood to the eye. So keep that in mind. So right here, what you get is you get pigment dispersion on the endothelial surface of the cornea, and it sits in a particular pattern. It sits in a broad triangle in the lower third central part of the cornea. And when you get that pigment dispersion settling there, that I think is just due to where aqueous 
you know, currents flow and where they go, but in any event, you get pigment sitting there on that lower third central cornea shaped like a triangle. It's called what? Anybody? Whose triangle? Arts. Art. Arts. Triangle. And so you see that in pigment dispersion syndrome. And it's called a, another word we use for it is a Krukenberg spindle. And so you see these, and that's a real tip off for pigment dispersion glaucoma. Okay. Eileen, another cause of secondary opening of glaucoma would be I mean this is not just pigment dispersion. Well, it, it's kind of recessed, but it's recessed because something is pushing the iris away because it's growing up into the angle here. Exactly, and arising from where? Uh, the ciliary body. From the ciliary body. So you can get secondary open angle glaucoma from an infiltrative process, and that is a tumor. Most commonly, a malignant melanoma of the ciliary body, which will then grow up into the angle here and can give you a secondary open angle glaucoma. And here you can see just another view of it. This is cornea, iris root. And right in here into the mesh root now, there's a tumor coming from the ciliary body growing right up into the angle. So secondary open angle glaucoma due to an infiltrative process. All right, we got an easy one here. I guess, Chris, you're next. Pseudo-X. Pseudo-X. And how does pseudo-X cause glaucoma? Uh, so... So, I mean, the material of this, the so you get deposits from the pseudo-X. Exactly. That material, which is, you know, here deposited on the surface of the crystalline lens, you can see where the pupil is scraped it as it pupil moves in and out, that material will actually get deposited in the trabecular meshwork. But interestingly enough, it's even more than that. Exfoliation is really an interesting entity. Not only do you get the exfoliative material clogging up the meshwork, if you will, it's kind of like leaves clogging the storm, storm drain on the street. You get that, but you even get exfoliative material actually inside the cells, juxtacanalicularly and, and even affecting the little vessels coming out. And so it's more than just clogging it up, but if you want to think about it, it's actually the most, you know, the, the biggest part of it is actually just that exfoliative material clogging up the drain, if you will. And so again, you get a secondary open angle glaucoma, and you can see all this exfoliative material sitting here on the surface of the lens. And this just shows you it in retroillumination. And so this is very common here in Utah, so you'll see this a lot. You've really got to watch these people carefully because they can get into trouble in a hurry. So people with, with significant exfoliation, you know, they can look really good, and in a short period of time, the pressure can shoot way up and then go down the tubes in a hurry. And so you really want to keep a close eye on these guys with exfoliation. And remember, we saw this when we talked about the lens. You've got the so-called iron filing pattern of this protonaceous material sitting on the lens capsule. But in addition, here is the trabecular meshwork, and here's all that stuff sitting on the inside surface of the cornea and clogging up the meshwork. And so you can get a significant, fairly severe, secondary open angle glaucoma with exfoliation. Now, when you're treating both exfoliative glaucoma and you're treating pigment dispersion glaucoma, these respond pretty well to argon lasers because argon laser works by being absorbed by pigment and making heat. And so because there's pigment in pigment dispersion but also in exfoliation, you can get a pretty good bang for your bucks. So you can do argon laser. Now, we're now using the SLT, Select Laser, which also works pretty well in these secondary open end glaucomas due to both pigment and exfoliative syndrome. All right. Renee, what are we seeing here?
What if they've had no cataract surgery? Um, I'd probably think of either phagolytic glaucoma, phagomorphic glaucoma, acute angle closure glaucoma. Okay. So that's a good differential because we're talking about glaucoma, obviously. And so you want to think about what are, you know, lenticular causes of glaucoma. And that's another broad category of glaucoma. And so if you've got a glaucoma where the patient has a, you know, just a big nuclear cataract and they're a little hyperopic and the angle's getting narrower and narrower, what kind of glaucoma do we call that? That's phacomorphic. Phacomorphic glaucoma. So it's the size and shape of the lens that's narrowing the angle. And, causing you glaucoma. What was the first entity you said? That was uh, in terms of glaucoma. Uh-huh. Uh, phacolytic. phacolytic glaucoma. And what is phacolytic glaucoma? That's what happens when you have a patient with either a mature or hypermature cataract and then the uh, lens proteins leak through that little spaces and the capsule and then it causes a, um, it's macrophages actually engulf the, uh, the lens particles and clog up the trabecular meshwork. So here you see, here's the iris, cornea, meshwork, look at these macrophages. And again, if you want to sound intelligent, you say British. Costas will tell you that. So you say macrophages, you know. If you, if you talk British, you, you sound very intelligent. So it was, you know, 0.2 centimeters long and it had macrophages in it. So you sound very intelligent when you do that. So you can see these stuffed macrophages. They're just huge. They're, you know, when you look at a patient with phacolytic glaucoma, if the cornea is not too edematous from the pressure, you can see these gigantic macrophages floating around. They're just stuffed with pigment. But not only do the macrophages clog up the meshwork, but just the pigment does too. And so the treatment for this is what? Yeah, cataract surgery. So you not only remove the lens, but also you want to flush out the anterior chamber real good. And people used to talk about, you know, irrigating the anterior chamber. Well, you know, when you do phaco, you've got a lot of IA going in there anyway. So, I mean, you know, we flush out the OVD pretty good anyway. So I'm not sure what, what they mean by flushing it out. But, you know, if you do have a case of phacolytic glaucoma, when you get the lens out of there, as you're removing the OVD, you know, just kind of swing around the anterior chamber and let that fluid you know, flush out all these macro, macrophages and this protein, and then um, doing the cataract surgery is curative. But again, this is a secondary open angle glaucoma because the angle is still open in this case. And this is actually an anterior chamber aspirate. And so before we had OCTs and other ways of looking in there, people were concerned about what this was, and so you'd actually aspirate it. You would send it for culture, but then you could also just squirt it out and, and look, and these are macrophages just stuffed with protein again. All right, so we talked about open angle glaucoma, and this is a really crude schematic, but it's a good way to think about it. Now, you can go to closed angle glaucoma, or you can go to angle recession, where there's been a trauma and the angle's been torn loose. All right, so Nick, what do you think about this patient? Okay. What would you be concerned about here? You've got a unilateral injected eye with a mid-dilated pupil. What if I tell you that that pupil doesn't move very well and this one's normal over here? It could be some traumatic injuries as a result. Um, I don't know, trauma to the right eye. One more hint. Here's the slit lamp. What does the slit lamp show? Something we see on the little patients all the time at four to six months. Um, patient's left lower side, there's some kind of fiber deposition or something on the cornea. That's actually on the surface. Look at the slit beam. Um, what is that oh, showing? The iris is bulging posterior. Yeah, look at the, his look at the, look at the picture of the, the slit beam hitting the cornea. And then look at it hitting the iris, and you can actually literally see that bowing forward. And in fact, in the periphery, it's almost touching. And so that's called iris Bombay. Bombay. And so when you get a relative pupillary block, then you get aqueous building up behind the iris, you'll get forward bowing of the iris, and eventually you'll get angle closure glaucoma. Now, this doesn't usually happen in people with normal you know, appearing angles. Usually these are people with narrowed angles. Either they're narrowed from um, how the patient's built 
or they're narrowed secondary to the lens swelling as time goes on. Even eventually you can get the phacomorphic glaucoma they talk about, the lens coming forward. But it's interesting, depending on what part of the world you're in now, if you're in, in Singapore and your patients are ethnic Chinese, more than half of your glaucoma patients will be angle closure or chronic, you know, narrow angle glaucoma. More than half. Same thing in Hong Kong. So very, very common in people of Chinese ancestry and where you see them reported is Singapore and Hong Kong. And so very common. In Utah, we don't see this that often. I mean, occasionally we'll see narrow angle glaucoma or ataxial glaucoma, but because it's, it's uncommon, you want to keep your radar up higher because you don't want to miss one of these. And so you see that forward bowing. So what happens is, is you get some kind of a relative pupillary block there where the aqueous can't go through. And the setting where you can trigger one of these, where you've got to be really careful, is if you have someone with a narrow angle, an angle at risk, and you dilate them, they don't go into an attack of glaucoma right away. But when they go home, you know, two hours later, that dilation is wearing off. Once it hits that mid position, the apposition of the iris to the lens is the greatest right there in that mid dilated. That's where they'll get the attack. So you want to check the angle first before you dilate somebody. And the techs here are really good. And they'll grab me two, three times a week and say, can you look at these angles before we dilate? Because you want to make sure that you're not going to have an angle at risk. And this is one that we didn't catch early enough. Jack, what am I showing here? Uh, looks like the angle. Uh, the ciliary body. Here's the ciliary body. Here's the angle back here. What's happening here? Costas. Okay. And what do we call it where there's this almost like a connective tissue sticking the iris to the peripheral cornea? What is that? Uh-huh. Uh, it's a chronic situation where it could be a membrane. Um, so this is a chronic, you know, angle closure, chronic narrow angle, but what do we call it actually when you get this, you know, peripheral iris stuck to the area of the peripheral cornea blocking off the meshwork? It's a three-letter abbreviation. Okay, so it sounds like this is called. This, we abbreviate this PAS, peripheral anterior synechia. And so, when you get the iris in the periphery stuck up to the cornea, eventually that can permanently block it off. So that's why you don't want to miss like a, a chronic angle closure. And so the problem is, is these acute attacks. You can tell those easily, but someone who slowly but surely narrows their angle and then eventually closes it off. This is kind of the slow, creeping, chronic angle closure. And these are the ones that are tough to diagnose. And then, you know, a patient will come in and their pressure will be creeping up slowly but surely. You see them, the angle's closed, pressure's 40, they're not having pain. And they're, you know, they're cupped out. So you want to catch them before they get to this point. And here you can see another one, and so you can have secondary angle closure glaucoma due to peripheral anterior synechia. Adam, what's another reason you can have secondary angle closure glaucoma? This is subtle, but it shows it right here. Um, well, vascularization came to mind. I'm looking for it here. Very subtle. See those little vessels there? So you can get, exactly, you can get secondary angle closure from neovascularization. So anything that can cause ischemia in the eye, you know, central vein occlusion, uh, just ischemic eye in general, diabetes, you can get neovascularization of the iris and those little neovascular vessels eventually will grow through there and you will actually get the iris and the periphery sticking to the cornea. So neovascular glaucoma can give you a secondary angle closure. What happens is, is as these little tiny blood vessels, here's the tiny blood vessels, very fine tiny blood vessels, the little endothelial cells can have some contractile properties with them too. So as these abnormal blood vessels grow, they can contract and they can shrink the tissue and eventually narrow the angle. And then once it sticks, then it'll stay stuck. So that's secondary, secondary narrow angle glaucoma due to neovascularization.
All right, Russell, there's another reason for angle closure and, you know, Iris Bombay and all, and what would this be showing? Looks like this is someone who probably had a posterior ischemia with a uh, pigment epithelium from a high risk of deposit on the lens capsule, which could be a secondary inflammation, probably most commonly. Uh, and then you get, uh, you get pupillary occlusion because of it. Okay. So you can see right here, this is, it looks like kind of like a dinosaur, you know, going up there. But, but if you look, you'll see where the iris pigment epithelium was actually stuck to the anterior lens capsule. This is not an artifact. And then when we looked at the path, the pigment stayed stuck on there. So you get what's called a posterior synechia, which is sticking down of the pupillary margin to the lens posterior. And that can give you an occluded angle and then secondary angle closure from that. And so sometimes you can get a membrane that grows completely across the angle blocking off. And someone who's got, say, chronic uveitis, chronic inflammatory disease, you can get an angle where it's occluded. It's got a membrane completely around it. Or you can get 360 degree synechia posteriorly, and they call this seclusion with an S, so secluded. Uh, pupil. And so those will again keep the aqueous behind the iris instead of in front of it, and you get a secondary angle closure of glaucoma. How do you treat this, at least uh, acutely? Uh, LPI. Yeah, so you can do a laser peripheral iridectomy. And if you guys haven't done one of these before, they're really cool. You put your little you know, mirror on for doing the laser PI, and you crank the YAG laser up to five. So you really crank it heavy, and you put a double burst in it and you aim for a thin part of the iris there, and then you just hit the button and it goes, it goes, boom! And you can instantly see aqueous gushing through there, and then you'll see the iris go backwards. It's pretty cool when you do it. And so you have to be careful when you're doing it, you don't go, wow, you know, with the patient, but it's <laughs> rare you get instant gratitude when you do something, but this is instantaneous, so it's pretty cool when you do do it. All right, Ashley, what's different about this angle? It's recessed, so here's the meshwork up here. Here's an aqueous vein here, and look, here's the iris root right here. So when you think about a recessed angle, what's the most common etiology for this? Trauma. Blunt trauma, so usually it's blunt trauma, so someone will get hit. This is one that you'll often see um, secondary to the two dudes. And for those of you who don't know, you know, all ocular trauma in, in uh, young males is caused by two dudes. Never one, two. I was just sitting there minding my own business, you know, and these two dudes jumped me, you know. It's, it's the same story, two dudes. And so the two dudes jumped in me as trauma to his eye, and you get this recessed angle. This is usually associated with what other finding when you see them acutely in the eye? Hyphema. And so when someone has an acute hyphema from a blunt trauma, you don't want to be putting a gonio mirror on there and mashing on the eye where that's, you know, got fresh blood in there. So you wait about a month, let the hyphema go away. If all is okay, then you bring them back and you do the gonio. Now, bonus question for you, Ashley. How soon after a blunt injury with angle recession does glaucoma occur? Um, Nico. Eileen. <laughs> Ten years. Ten years, very good. Ten years, seven to ten years. And so the reason that that's important is these are young dudes, you know. They're, the last guy I had with a traumatic hyphema and a recessed angle, he wanted to know, hey, man, when can I lift again, doc, you know. And it's like, you know, you got blood in your eye. You really don't want to be, like, you know, pumping your bicep curls, you know, right now. And, and so, of course, his blood trauma was he got hit with a paint. You know, he's doing one of these paint gun battles. And, and of course, he took off his glasses. No, he didn't take them off. I said, well, you're wearing safety goggles. Well, they didn't make us. You know, and it's like, so he's the other guy. So we had a long conversation with him about birth control. You know, <laughs> don't pass on this stupid gene, you know, to another generation. But, 
But you really have to put the fear of God in these guys. And what I mean by that is you have to let them know that they're at risk for developing glaucoma 10 years from now. So when you're a 19-year-old dude, you don't really think about that. But again, I've had in my career several times where someone has come back in with blurred vision. And this is back when we had paper charts. You pull out the old paper chart. Sure enough, 10 years before, they had blunt trauma, recessed angle. The pressure slowly builds up. They don't notice it then they end up coming in with a blurred vision. The reason it's blurred is their pressure's 45 now, their cup is 0.99, and they have a little temporal island of vision, and everything else is wiped out. And it's slowly gone on, so they didn't notice it. So you gotta put the fear of God in these guys and say, you know what, you could go blind from this for the next 10 years, so you have to come in once a year. And sometimes the blind word helps. I don't usually say blind to people. I say loss of vision, I say blurred vision, you never say blind, but, in a dude with an angle recession, you say blind. So they say, come back every year or you could go blind. The angle and recession happens immediately. Happens immediately. It's a blunt trauma where the uh, eye gets deformed a little bit and the aqueous pushes everything back and the tear actually occurs not so much, even at the, at the iris root, it actually tears into the face of the ciliary body. So you can get an aerial dialysis where the iris root will tear loose, but oftentimes what will happen is, is the face of the, where the iris root meets the ciliary body will tear. So you can see the iris root is still attached here and that tear goes into the face of the ciliary body. Where here's a normal angle down here in comparison. So secondary angle recession, 10 years out the glaucoma occurs. And then eventually I think what happens is, is that traumatized meshwork eventually just scars over. And I'm not sure the exact etiology and why it takes 10 years. Okay, so this is just to kind of show you, this is the same eye with a front and back picture at once. Here we have, look at the angle recess there. Not only that, they had a traumatic cataract, so there's a little summer ring here. And of course, here's the total 0.99 cupped optic nerve with chronic angle recession. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit now about what glaucoma does to the optic nerve, and so Chris, what do you think the cup to disc ratio is right here? Uh, it's .9. Yeah, if you look, it goes way out here, at least 0.8. It's sometimes yeah. hard to see right there, so at least 0.8. And so you'd really worry about that. And the nice thing now is, is in the olden days when I was a resident, we would just have to draw them and take a guess or maybe take some stereo pictures of them. Now you've got you know, you've got OCTs, you can, you know, mark out what the cup is, you can look at the nerve fiber layer, you've got all kinds of ways of looking at what glaucoma does. But remember, in the, in the end stage, glaucoma is a disease where the pressure is too high for the optic nerve to tolerate. And it's not a disease where the pressure is too high, it's too high to tolerate. So there are people who get glaucoma with even a low pressure, there are people who don't get glaucoma with a high pressure, and so you want to be really careful with your terminology. But the bottom line is you lose the nerve fibers as they're coming in here, and people will argue back and forth, and maybe they'll talk about this when you guys do glaucoma. Is this a disease where they get mechanical disruption of good humors into the nerve fibers that goes into the lamina cribrosa? Is it ischemia? Is it a combination of both? We don't know, but what happens is, is you get the nerve will cup out and you'll get posterior bowing and you'll get damage to those nerve fibers as they're coming through the optic nerve and through the lamina cribrosa. And again, here's a big, at least 0.8 cup, although this one's got a better rim, but look how deep that is. And the problem is, is you want to stop the disease before you get to this. So this is more than a 0.9 cupping. This is, I even call this more than one because you can even get excavation underneath the edge. So when you look at, at one of these, you can actually see right here, sometimes you can actually see a blood vessel will go in and it'll actually dip around to where you don't see it. And so when you get severe cupping, you have what's called a bean pot. I don't know if you've ever seen like the Boston bean pots where it's, it's wider in the middle and narrower at the top. And so this is severe cupping. Now, interestingly, this patient had trauma. There's a scar through the cornea and adherent leucoma to the ruptured lens with the summer ring. But again, totally cupped out disc. 
And here's what I was talking about. See how that vessel goes around the edge and then disappears behind there? And so you can actually see vessels disappearing around the edge. So the idea is, is you want to get it before it gets to this point. Here's posterior bowing of the lamina cribrosa, where it's crunched back here. So this is the end stage. You don't want to let it get to this point. And here you can see secondary atrophy. Look at the widening of the subarachnoid space of the nerve there. And again, look at that overhang. And it comes in. So this looks like one of those things that Taben climbs, you know, where you, it hangs out more than you, and you grab it with your hand and dangle and then scurry over the top of it. So Eileen can do that too. Who can do that? Eileen too? Okay. So Eileen, think of that. You're scaling that. It's a big cottonwood, little cottonwood canyon where the big cliffs are. And there you are climbing that little lip right there. Here's a close-up. Now, if you look, look at the nerve fiber layer there. It's completely gone. I mean, the nerve fiber layer is gone. We want to prevent it from getting to this point. So that's end-stage glaucomatous optic atrophy, no matter what the etiology. Okay, well, I don't know, Nick. This one's an obscure one. This is an optic nerve seen in cross-section. I'll give you a hint. Patient had a sudden rise of pressure. This is an obscure one. Costas. Uh, you can see blood you know, between these fibers. The key thing I want to point out is a focal area of pallor. So this isn't like a MS nerve or something. A little focal anterior, just behind the lamina cribrosa, area of, of this pale staining to this nerve. There are some infarctions. So there's a focal infarction there, and this has a weird name to it. Anybody know it? Oh, I, I skipped you. Oh my God, I skipped Renee. Okay, so you get to go back. What is this? Sorry. Schnabel's optic atrophy. So it's interesting. Schnabel, I don't know who he was. It's not like Fuchs. He's obviously a German. But if you have an acute pressure rise, like an acute angle closure glaucoma, pressure shoots up to 50, you can get these focal areas of, of pale ischemia. Some people even theorize that you're actually pushing vitreous into there, you're pushing fluid into there, and so you get this focal area of optic nerve damage and ischemia. It's Schnabel's cavernous optic atrophy. And I'm glad you said something, because otherwise it would have skipped you. And here's a nice stain for Alshin blue. What is Alshin blue stain? Mucopolysaccharide, exactly. And so that's why people think that maybe the high pressure is actually pushing vitreous into the nerve there. And so mucopolysaccharide is one of the components of vitreous along with a lot of water. And so this is a special stain for mucopolysaccharides here stuffed into the optic nerve in Schnabel's cavernous optic atrophy. Another thing you can get, let's see, I guess, we've been, Adam, first of all, what part of the eye are we looking at here and what are we seeing? Okay, so anterior lens capsule, and what's going on when we go to the higher power? Is this kind of focal vacuolated spaces? Yeah. Like focal anterior vacuolated spaces, the little lens epithelial cells have been disturbed. Again, this is someone who had an acute pressure rise. What do we call these guys? Uh, exactly. So those are the two cool words in glaucoma. <laughs> Schnabel's atrophy and glaucomflecken. So that sounds real good. So it sounds like, you know, the German internist, you know, telling the young guy when he comes in, you have Glaukenflecken. Oh, my God. Does penicillin treat it, you know? So here we have Glaukenflecken. And so these are a focal ischemia of the anterior lens epithelial cells. And when you see them, you'll see the little, little whitish gray spots that form under the anterior capsule. And then eventually they fade with time. So that's a sign of an acute pressure rise for whatever reason. Now, eventually, the glaucoma, we showed you what it does to the optic nerve. So, Russell, what's the, what's the most part, part of the retina that's affected by glaucoma? The ganglion cell layer and the nerve fiber layer will eventually thin out. Now, look at this picture here because next week you guys get a week off. I don't know why they do that, but you'd just be sick of path, so you get a week off. But February 2nd, we're going to do retina. And we're going to spend the first 10 minutes talking about what ogres, onions, and retinas have in common. 
layers. So know those layers of the retina for the second. So glaucoma affects just the inner layer, the ganglion cell layer and the nerve fiber layer. And here you can see, here's a normal macula on top. There's the multiple ganglion cell layers. And here's a glaucomatous macula at the bottom where it's very scant. So end stage glaucoma affecting the retina, eventually affecting the fibers. Now there is an odd type of glaucoma that I don't know a whole lot about. I don't think any of us do. And this is congenital glaucoma. And so congenital glaucoma in the olden days, again, when I was a resident, you put a gonio on these kids when they're sleeping in the OR or kepi lens. You look at the angle and you'd see this little velvety membrane across the angle and they call that Barkhan's membrane. And so people theorized that this membrane would grow across the angle in congenital glaucoma. So if you went in there with a knife and just sliced that membrane open, then the angle would open and the glaucoma would be improved. Well, it turns out it's a lot more tricky than that. And really there is kind of a maldeveloped angle in a lot of congenital glaucoma cases with this little membrane going across it. So you can't just really cut it. Um, these kids are tough to treat because, you know, kids scar, they're like rabbits. They scar, they heal real rapidly. And so they don't really respond real well to surgery. But this is a close-up again, this Barkhan's membrane, they call it. And you just look, that's just a maldeveloped meshwork. It just doesn't develop properly. And that's what you see very commonly in a congenital glaucoma. All right, so we want to talk about another entity of diseases that can cause glaucoma. Russ, did I ask you already? Oh, yeah. You did. Yeah. Okay. I did. Okay, actually, this is a weird looking, weird looking eye. This is a 25 year old and their other eye is absolutely normal and this eye has been giving them blurring and pain for a while. What the heck are we seeing here? No injury to the eye. No past ocular history. So, I'm thinking about an ice syndrome, like a general ice syndrome. Ice? What does ice stand for? Um, irido-corneal-endothelial-dystrophy. Exactly. Actually, or syndrome. Just ice. Irido-corneal-endothelial syndrome. So it's a syndrome that has kind of three different ways it can present, depending on if you're a lumper or a splitter. And so the key is it's unilateral. Usually it'll start showing up in your teens or 20s, and so it'll progressively increase. Now, this is the most common kind of subset of ice, and what's going on right here? So iris atrophy. This is called essential iris atrophy. So that's the most common kind of subset where you see it's called corectopia or polychoria. Polychoria, as Costas could tell us, poly, many pupils, so many pupils. And so you can see multiple areas where the iris is stretched, it's atrophied, it's abnormal. This is called essential iris atrophy. All right, Nico, what's the second subset? Oh, he's looking frantically in there. Oh my God, what is it? It is the iris nevus syndrome. Not quite. That's the third one. So you get, you get partial credit because that's the third one. What's the second one in the triad? Chandler's. Chandler's. And, and how is Chandler's a little different than essential iris atrophy? It's more dispersed. It's dispersed and you get corneal edema with it. So for some reason, you know, everybody gets some kind of iris atrophy. Everybody gets a little bit of pigment, but in Chandler's syndrome, for some reason, you get more effect on the endothelium and you get more corneal edema. And of course, the third one you said was? Iris nevis. Iris nevis syndrome. And here you see a nice picture. These look kind of cool when you see them in clinic. Here's a broad slit beam of the iris, and you see a little velvety appearance to the surface of the iris, and you see these little bumps of pigmented cells sticking up through it. Now, what, Eileen, is the common etiology to all of these? What's the you know, final common denominator of all of the ICE syndromes? Um, an abnormal proliferation of the endothelial cells that act like the endothelium. Exactly. So they, so they, they grow. And what, is, what do endothelial cells lay down when they're growing? 
Yeah, and what's that basic membrane called of the endothelial cells? Desmetic membrane. membrane, exactly. So you get what's called desmetization of the anterior chamber. So these abnormal cells grow across the angle, closing off the angle, they grow on the surface of the iris. And eventually, of course, as they're growing on the iris, you can get the iris pulled in different directions, that iris atrophy, you can get little pigmented cells growing with this. And in fact, this is a cool one. This is one that, that we had. This was actually on the cover of the Archives of Ophthalmology about 15 years ago. And we had this patient, and, and they did a big peripheral aridectomy to try to control the pressure. And this is a PAS stain, and this is the posterior surface. This is the anterior surface of the iris. Look, there's a PAS positive membrane. There's decimase membrane all along the surface of the iris. But note these little pigmented cells poking through. And when we looked at it in close-up, here's decimase membrane, and here are these little pigmented cells. And so this is the, the you know, pigment component to it, okay? So the three parts of the ICE syndrome, you know, central iris atrophy, Chandler's, and then the, the um, you know, iris nevus syndrome. And so you can see this is the iris nevus portion of that. They love this on boards. It's on there every year. So something you gotta know, even though you rarely see these, you gotta know these. There's a close-up. That's from his membrane, this little pigmented bump popping through it. So you're saying the iris nevus ones, they always have pigmented in those? They have little pigmented nevi, but if you look at them, there'll be this velvety surface of the iris from the decimase membrane going across there, and then these little pigmented cells will be popping through. Now there is a th another category that you have to memorize that can cause secondary glaucomas. And, well, I guess you're, you're next. You are next. So there's a whole category here, and I'll give you a hint. George Waring, who sadly passed away a few months ago, categorized these with the so-called stepladder classification. Does that ring a bell? No. Anybody? There's another group of secondary glaucomas. Okay. All right. Exactly. So there is another entity that, that will do these. And, and in the olden days, again, when they used to teach us that mesoderm is what forms the anterior chamber angle, they called this an anterior chamber cleavage syndrome. Because what they thought was that this mesoderm would grow into the angle and then eventually cleave and form the angle. Well, it's not mesoderm. It's actually neural crest cells that do this. But in any event, as the meshwork is being formed and the anterior chamber angle is being formed, they sometimes will have some malformations. They call this anterior chamber cleavage syndrome. But George Waring had a good stepladder classification. Again, it's multiple different entities under the same broad umbrella. And so he would put from the simplest to the more complex, and it's a good way in your brain of memorizing these, knowing the stepladder. So the first thing that you see in this particular entity is right here. And what are we seeing right here? Embryo toxin. And so people thought that at one time this was due to some toxin forming while the baby was formed. And so you will get a thickened Schwabies line that's more anterior. So when you look at kids with this, you look with the slit lamp, you'll literally see a line that's kind of concentric with the limbus but further away. And so you'll get a thickened anterior di displaced Schwabies line. They call it posterior embryotoxin. And here you can see kind of this thickened, funny looking, you know, termination of decimase membrane. So posterior embryotoxin. And then eventually you can get posterior embryotoxin with some bands of stuff coming up from the iris adherent there that can close off the meshwork but actually make the iris adherent. And what is that next one? Renee. Nope, not yet. No, this is in the periphery still, not in the center. Axenfeld-Rigers. Axenfeld-Rigers. And so people used to separate these Axenfeld-Rigers. Now people are just putting them together. So Axenfeld's originally you had little, you know, bands of stuff going to the posterior embryotoxin from the peripheral iris. Rieger's anomaly was the same thing with loss of iris. And so you'd get iris atrophy in those areas. So now they call it Axenfeld-Rigers. Then you go further down 
the step ladder and you go further down the step ladder, then you can get a central area of opacified cornea. Nick, any stabs on what that would be? Peter's anomaly. Okay, so see, at least you listen. That's a good sign. So Peter's anomaly. And what's interesting about Peter's anomaly is you get areas where you can get strands of stuff adherent to the iris, I mean, from the iris adherent to the cornea, but they're more central. But what's weird about this is you will get an area in the central posterior cornea where for some reason decimase and endothelium just don't form properly. And so you'll get this area, they call this an internal ulcer. Now you have to know all these damn German names of von Hippel. So von Hippel described a bunch of stuff. And, you know, and one of the things he described was this internal ulcer of Peter's anomaly. And, and again, some of the ways I think about this is, what's weird about Peter's is it looks like someone took a bite out of the central posterior cornea. So you get corneal edema in that area, but sometimes it's like the iris, I mean the um, lens went up and bit the cornea, and so you'll get a central anterior subcapsular cataract kind of underneath the areas where there's that defect in the cornea. And so I, I like to remember it as, you know, maybe the lens, you know, took a big bite out of the cornea and then pulled it back down again. So you get this central ulcer with corneal edema, and you can also get some focal anterior subcapsular cataracts in these. So again, these anterior chamber cleavage syndrome, just like the ice syndrome, they love asking questions on these because it's obscure. There's a lot that you have to learn. And so that's the whole point of boards is separating wheat from chaff. And so that's the way they delineate people is looking at things like the, the anterior chamber cleavage syndromes. And so here's that cornea, here's some edema, and sure enough, here's that central ulcer of von Hippel in Peter's anomaly. So George Waring wrote this in the 70s, and it's a classic paper. It's called the stepladder classification. And even though they're arguing about what causes it and what it does, it's still a good way to memorize this. So keep that in mind. And this is from Gaudí's apartment building roof. And here again is the Sagrada Familia church, which they're working on right there. So next time it's going to be retina. And so uh, please know the layers, that's important. Mm -hmm.